Good morning, everybody. I'm Chris Modrich. I'm the Valve Product Specialist for Lesman. I'd like to thank everybody for showing up this morning and taking time out of your busy schedule. In this 30-minute webinar titled Flexible Low Flow Valves for Changing Flow Requirements, we're going to cover the Richards Industrials Low Flow Branded Control Valves with a quick overview of the Low Flow Control Valve body, trim, and actuation options. Um, Jake's going to go over our uh, the main part of this will be the basics of direct signal control, which I think you'll find very interesting and compelling and will help you save a bunch of money if you have the right applications. Jake will get you through that. And finally, we'll do a, a brief lab demonstration to show you how well this thing actually works when, when you take the positioner out of the out of the uh, system. So our presenter today, Jake Walworth, is the low product, uh, the, sorry, the low flow product manager, and he's responsible for business and product development as well as training for representatives and customers. So initially, everybody's muted, and if you have any questions as Jake goes, you can use the question little uh, question option box right built into the browser, and then I'll pop in and, and have Jake do it. And then later on in the session, I'll unmute everybody. So if you care to jump in and uh, interact and ask questions, you're more than welcome. So with all that said, Jake, uh, take it away and just be careful of the background noise behind you. You can hear it a little bit. All right. Well, guys, like, like Chris said, thanks for taking time out of your guys' uh, busy schedule. Today, we'll, uh, we'll briefly review the low flow control valve line, just to give you a sense of what that encompasses. Uh, and then we'll, towards the end, we'll be focusing on as Chris said, utilizing an I2P over some of the other actuation options, whether it be a positioner or a motor, et cetera, and how that can how that can save you money and also what applications that you know that can be useful for. Um, but a little bit about low flow. We're a brand of Richards Industrials. Uh, we're based in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we focus on process control valves and regulators uh, two inches and under for you know industrial markets, chemical processing. Uh, as well as pharma and food and beverage, the the low flow line is really catered to uh, to process uh, pilot plants, um, injection applications, and in applications where really fine control and accuracy are important. Um, and as you can see on the slide here, we have a wide range of control valves for many different applications, be it high temperature, cryogenic. Uh, we have motor actuated options. Um, depending on what your applications call for. And so with that, we'll, we'll get, into, get into the next couple slides here. And if at any point you guys have questions, please don't hesitate. And at the end, like Chris said, we'll have a, uh, we'll have a time for, for you guys all to speak and ask any questions you guys might have or that might come up. So control valve overview at low flow. Our, kinda, our core product is called the Mark 708. It's a, it's a globe style control valve similar to uh, Azure control, bread research control valves, uh, your, your Bauman control valves. That's what this product is competing against regularly out in the field. Um, but just kind of a thousand foot overview, our pressure ranges, we can get up into uh, 12,000 PSI inlets for, you know, offshore for high pressure applications. You can see our temperature range goes up to 550, uh, all the way down to cryogenic at minus 425. Um, we have a wide range of CV offerings. Uh, those are just our standards. Oftentimes, we'll do custom CVs below 0 .0001 um, for really, really micro flow applications. Um, line size is again quarter inch up to two inch. Um, we have pneumatic and electric options for actuators. And again, we're made in Cincinnati. Everything we do uh, from Richards is made here at our site. Nothing's coming from from anywhere else or being sent out. Everything's done here. Um, so we we take pride in, in doing a quality product uh, built here in Cincinnati. These are our two different offerings of control valves. Uh, we have the Mark 708, which is which is going to be these guys, a little bit smaller. We have cast bodies, and these go up to one inch. And then to get higher flow and to get uh, some more materials options, we do a Mark 8000 which is gonna be 100% bar stock body. You can see it's got a little bit bigger actuator. It's a little bit more robust. And these are higher flow versions that we, we do 100% from bar stock. So we do these in any material that we can source in bar stock, be it, you know, Monel, Hastelloy, other exotics. 
We also do those in Kynar, PVC, uh, CPVC, and you know other plastics that uh, that that are out there. Um, our soft materials we offer EPDM, Biton, Buna, Teflon, and we've we've again we've done stuff outside of that for applications that may that may require different temperature, different pressure, uh, different pressures. Our end connections uh, we do we do a lot a lot of different end connections. I'm, I've actually been seeing recently in a lot of process, uh, a lot of process applications that are low pressure, industrial guys going with the tri-clamp ends because it's more convenient. And so we do a lot of stuff that's outside of the catalog, uh, be it materials and connections, um, anything we can do to customize or to give you guys a valve that you know is really going to perform in your guys' respective applications, we do. So I just want to emphasize. If it's not something you see on the catalog or if it looks like we don't have something, please let Chris or whoever you're working with at Lessman know because a lot of times our engineers, you know, they can come together and create something unique or tailor something that's a little bit different and maybe not seen in our brochures, you know, to help you guys with your with your challenging applications. Uh, the Mark 708, again, this is just a, you know, just a broad overview of what it is. Um, as you can see there, our positioner is a Siemens PS2. That is just kind of our our standard positioner that we use. We don't manufacture a positioner, um, and so Siemens is kind of what we made standard. Um, but that's kind of what a what a flanged up Mark 708 is going to look like with a side positioner, just for a good just a good view. And then some of the some of the the key features of the Mark 708. Um, this is this is one of them. It's called the bolted body bonnet design. So you have the body and bonnet with four bolts. It allows for easy trim changes. You can unbolt this, keep the entire body in line. You deep well socket out your plug. You can see that your uh, or, or your seat rather, and you can see that your plug is on a bayonet connection. So you pull that off and replace it with a new plug. Deep well socket out your seat, a new seat. And you can have the valve, you know, the trim changed or repaired, you know, in five to 10 minutes. And so from a maintenance perspective and downtime, it's extremely, extremely uh, easy, easy to get in and out of new trim sets. And so, you know, maybe your maybe your flow conditions or your application changes a little bit. And so instead of buying a new valve, you know, we're sending you a new plug and stem the next day. You know, one, it's a lot cheaper, but two, you can get a, you know, if there is a mistake, it can be remedied in a very short time frame, you know, reducing your downtime and your costs. Um, but in general, just for maintenance, it's it's a very friendly valve. If you ever have issues with the trim, if it's over or undersized, again, it's just it's really easy and quick to fix. There's no special tools needed, um, and it's it's a very maintenance friendly feature. Um, let's see here. Okay, so that quick change trim feature, um, again, it's available for all of the CVs, 0 0.05 and above. Once we get down below the, to the really micro flows, that's not applicable. Um, but complete seat and plug removal and reassembly in five minutes. Um, and again, just really is a maintenance, a maintenance friendly, friendly valve. Let's see. Reversible multi-spring actuator. Basically what this means is in any of our control valves, you have the ability to disassemble the actuator, switch the sides and go from air to open, air to close back and forth. Um, again, just a nice little feature that gives you, you know, a bit of flexibility in the same valve. Um, and so I don't know how often that's something that is utilized in the field, but it is a nice little feature that you can, you can do that without having to send it back to us or without really having to, uh, to do much at all. It's a, it's a simple disassemble, replace the plugs, reattach the air to the top, you know, to the other side and, and you're in your back up and running with a different, with a different setup valve. So in regards to accuracy, we think in our valve, this rolled diaphragm, uh, right here, we have a nitrile rubber diaphragm that goes out underneath the, uh, these diaphragm plates. Whereas most competitors, they don't have this little bit of slack or this little bit of roll. Um, and so it stretches. It just comes out from here and stretches and you get wear points all along their diaphragm. 
and it does not keep a consistent surface area for the air to act upon. So you don't get accurate, 100% accurate regulation. Whereas ours, because of this little bit of roll or slack, when that, when that control valve strokes up and down, the surface area of the diaphragm stays 100% the same. So you have a consistent, repeatable surface, which what you're pressurizing and, and accurate, accurate re-regulating. Um, so that's a really key feature from an engineering standpoint of how our valves can be uh, can be a little bit more accurate over time. All right, so now we're kind of getting into I think the main the main discussion of this PowerPoint and this kind of webinar, and it's it's about how do you, how can you save money with your valve selection and how you how you intend to actuate and operate that control valve? We see a lot of people, uh, you know, there's a lot of young engineers and a lot of a lot of people up there that are comfortable with the computer screen and, and positioners just because that's how they've known and how they've done it in the past. Um, but there are other ways, and there are, you know, there's one way in particular where we think we can we can save a lot of money. It's just dependent on what you need. Uh, and what you require from that valve. So when is a positioner necessary to use with our Mark 708? Um, you would think it's it's required. You would think that because most of our valves, people do use our Siemens positioner that you have to have it. But really, there's only two specific models that we require this Siemens PS2 positioner. And that is the Mark 708 double packed version and the Mark 708 bellows stem version. Those are both uh, kind of, I would say, protective or used in applications where you you don't want whatever the media is to get out. So anything that's anything that's dangerous or hazardous to getting on somebody's skin, and so therefore um, to compress the multiple packings and the bellows, you need the extra amount of force and thrust that the positioner has. But it's really just those two offerings. Those are the only two uh, versions that require our Siemens positioner. Everything else you could operate. Um, without. So uh, when is a positioner optional? Really any any other application that doesn't involve a double packed or a bellow stem seal, we can we can avoid using the Siemens PS2 positioner. Um, what are the benefits of utilizing these Siemens positioners or these smart positioners? Um, feedback. So when you want analyze, you know, data to analyze or feedback, you you do need one of these smart devices. Precise control uh, for different communication protocols, Profi bus, heart, you would require a, you know, a smart positioner. Uh, smart positioners can handle higher ranges of airline pressures. So if that's an issue, or if you have, you know, if your air air pressure is above 150 PSI, um, you know, a simple I to P can't handle that. So you might need to use a positioner. But really, in our, in, you know, from our perspective, those are the only instances where a positioner is 100% something you need to have. Um, what are the drawbacks of using these positioners? Well, one, they're 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 very very expensive, um, and so it's a big cost savings anytime you can avoid or sidestep using one of these smart devices. Um, they create potential for more maintenance issues. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon to have linkage issues with these positioners. If there's applications where there's heavy vibration or there's uh, maybe high temperature, they can tend to, you know, be finicky and create problems. Um, you know, also you have additional training required for these for these Siemens positioners. They're very, you know, I would say they're they take a, a good amount of training and resources to for somebody to completely understand how to use them and how to make complete use out of them, especially when they're as expensive as they are. It's not something that's a plug and play. Your engineers, your maintenance are gonna know how to use it. It does take somebody to really take time and learn how it functions and how it works with your valve. Um, and then also space considerations. If you guys are building skids or if you guys have tight you know, areas where real estate is at a premium, the, the side positioners can be a little can be a little chunky and they they can take up some space and so uh, that's just another consideration for areas that you know the positioner might might be a negative so let's see all right so here's kind of a general a general setup a general setup of how we would operate our control valve using an I to P converter in place of, you know, a positioner. And so the I to P, I to P converter is simply taking, it's, it's, it's basically taking a uh, current signal 
Um, in this case, most typically would be controlled by a uh, 4 to 20 milliamp um, signal generator. Um, you know, it could be handheld or it could be plugged into the larger uh, control system of, of the application. Uh, and it's converting that 4 to 20 signal into a pneumatic output, um, which is what gets piped into the actuator to make the actuator stroke the valve up or down. Um, so it's converting, you know, 4 to 20 milliamps into essentially 3 to 15 PSI of air supply to pipe into the actuator. Uh, and you can kind of see the, the setup on the diagram on the screen showing how that gets kind of wired up and controlled from the I to P converter to the, uh, the top or bottom of the actuator, depending on the action. So, and this is actually, we're gonna give you guys a little demo of this exact setup out on our bench here in a little bit. But I just wanted to kind of, again, resurface, touch on what are the questions that you, you know, you kind of ask yourself before deciding on, you know, do I need a positioner? Can I use an I2P? What, you know, what are my options and what determines which one I need? Um, so mainly our diagnostics, feedback, information, is that required? Do you guys need access to that? If so, you need a positioner, but if not, you don't. Um, is criticality and variability an issue? Are your flows changing? Are your pressures, you know, is there, is it not a very consistent process? Um, because if it's not, you probably do want a positioner to adjust for a lot of those fluctuations and changes. But if it is something consistent or it is something that doesn't have a ton of changes, ups and downs, then utilizing this I2P could very well be a good solution. Um, and then finally, is the location of the valve in the field a long distance from your I2P? Um, a long distance can cause some dead band and you know, affect the speed of response as long signal lines will require you know, a little more time and a little more air volume to actuate. So those are some of your things to consider before making that decision. Um, but you know, really what I wanted to emphasize is the cost difference. You know, if, we, if you're buying our control valve with the Siemens positioner, that positioner is going to be about a fourth of your a fourth to more of your cost, you know, in that product. And so it's a very, very expensive, you know, a very, very expensive part of your of your process. And you know, uh, if you can avoid that, you can save about, you know, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent overall on your valve utilizing an I to P with like a Marsh Bellofram transducer, or you know, if you guys have preferred I to P brands, or we're very okay to utilizing those. But there is a significant so, uh, you know, cost savings, as well as, you know, if you don't need all the bells and whistles, it does everything, you know, everything for your process that you might need. Um, but those are the main considerations. Uh, Chris, we're going to go out and do the demo. Did you guys want to do questions uh, or some, some any, any questions or just thoughts before? Uh, that's fine. I can unmute people if they want to throw in a question. I, I had a few thoughts as if you guys want to wander over and get your camera going. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. Jake, Jake mentioned uh, repeatedly the, the brand Siemens and Lester happens to be the Siemens rep. So that works great for us, but there are many brands of smart positioners that work wonderfully. And if you have a favorite brand, it can be put onto a low flow valve. So don't don't uh, don't get too caught up in the Siemens only deal. The Siemens one isn't particularly expensive. We're just looking to offer an opportunity um, to provide a greater value for your control valve needs. At the end of the day, a typical loop doesn't require feedback because the process variable is going to be the feedback, and the valve will just open or close more uh, based on the, the controller signal to achieve its goal. So when you're looking at um, do I use a positioner or don't I use a positioner? You know, I kind of like to break it down to, is it coarse control or is it fine control? Are you trying to control a, a temperature loop down to one degree or one-tenth of a degree? Um, the positioner is always going to be a little bit more accurate and repeatable um, because, it, because of the feedback off the stem on the, the valve. will will always put the positioner exactly where it needs to be. But you will be surprised, and, and hopefully when they come up with their video out of their lab, uh, you'll see just how smoothly and accurately this thing responds and how repeatable it is. So, all right, we see a picture. That's a good sign. All right, Chris, can you guys see this? Yes. 
Okay, so can you move in a little? Can you move in a little tighter? A little bit, a little bit closer. Closer. Yes, please. Actually, let's do this way. All right. That's so we, better. This better. We have here is our control valve, Mark 708, Marsh Bellafram I to P, and then Matt over here has got a 4 to 20 signal. So right now we've got 4 milliamp, and then we have that is closed. Yeah, so we have <clears throat> basically 4 milliamp from this controller. Uh, we have about 20 PSI coming from our airline into the I to P. Um, and the way it's set up right now with this reverse acting uh, 708 here, um, it needs air to open the valve. And you can kind of see uh, the, there's a plug sticking out here on the bottom. So this would be in the closed position. Uh, and I'm putting in 4 milliamps right now. I can adjust this to kind of any increment I want, but I'm just going to hit 100% open. So this is going to send a 20 milliamp signal into the I to P, which will dump uh, about 15 to 17 PSI of air into the actuator, and it'll open uh, open the valve and pull the stem up. So it might be a little bit tough to see on the video, but you should be able to see the stem linkage move up and down and the, the plug move up and down once I hit uh, 100% here. So you can kind of just you can cycle it between 0 and 100 or whatever your desired control path, um, you know, whatever you want to send to the I to P, and the valve will respond accordingly. Um, so this is a good situation, you know, a useful situation uh, for applications that don't involve a ton of accuracy, but you still want some degree of control. Um, the positioner is going to be more responsive and give you better control because it's directly connected to the the linkage, the stem. Um, so it has that feedback, it knows where that position is and it can maintain that position. Uh, but if you want something that's gonna give you quick, cheap, cheap, um, and pretty accurate, all things considered, control, uh, you should be able to use an I2P and uh, control your, your actuation that way. Chris, did you was that able to were you guys able to hear most of that? Yeah, no, it's actually going pretty good. You could get a little closer on the the valve trim moving up and down would be my yeah, comment. Yeah, let me try. That. Um, okay. So you've got there you go, hold it, Matt. So right now it's at full uh, open at twenty, and if Matt goes to zero percent, it'll take this down to four. So when I hit when I hit this button, watch the stem, it should go all the way down. It's, clo it's closing the valve since it's a reverse acting. It's basically dumping no air from the I to P into the actuator. And when he hits 20. Yeah, Jake, yeah. Jake, it's actually easier to see if you move your hands out of the way because it, it, it's struggling to focus. Okay. Go ahead and get rid of the, uh, we'll believe you on the simulator. Okay. okay. What, what I think the most compelling thing is, is how accurately that valve moves up and down and repeats. And these do work very, very well. And as Jake uh, mentioned earlier, the miracle to this is the design and the rolling diaphragm, which allows this thing to respond very accurately and quickly to a signal change. So at this point, I'm going to uh, go ahead and unmute everybody. I meant to do that prior. I apologize. If any of the attendees have any questions, um, jump in, please. A quick, uh, simple question. But so the difference between the positioner and just using the, the 4 to 20 signal. So that's, it, of course, you know, when you're trying to tune a valve, you want to look at the output trends on, on your valve to try to get it to tune right. So basically, you're, is that the difference? You'll be, it's a, you'll be looking at a 4 to 20, the percentage of conversion of 4 to 20 versus the, the positioner. Well, the positioner is mechanically connected, right? So if you tell it to go 50%, it's especially on a smart modern positioner with a display, it'll tell you I'm at 50%. When you just go direct signal, you'll have to depend on the visual indicator actually on the side of the valve. There's a, uh, 
as the trim moves up and down, there's a functionally a sure. washer and a mechanical indicator. The other thing you can look at is just simply your process variable. You know, are you achieving 50% flow or 50% temperature? Um, but you kind of, depending on how I mean, fast the loop yeah. is, of course. Yeah, it's always good to be able to, you know, look at a positioner in the field to kind of verify what you're seeing your output doing on on the DCS or your trend. But I guess I'm yeah. trying to fully yes. understand when you when you see percent output, uh, that is still coming from the the four to twenty signal. Correct. Well, basically, you you don't have any feedback in this case other than the visual indicator. Okay, so if you gave uh -huh. it 50% signal, somebody would literally have to walk to the valve and look, um, right. which may be in acceptable circumstances. We we sell lots of these to people who build pilot plants and smaller level skids where everything's kind of tight, and right. they're worried about two things: keeping costs down and keeping the real estate small. Okay, but they're not trying to see if the valve's producing a lot of chatter and, you know, up and down on percent output. They can just look that at That would it. be correct. They would just look at it locally. Okay. Yes, and, you're, and, you're, and also your process variable it will really tell the tale. If you have a very jumpy process variable, then you might have some sort of a tuning issue or or some sort of a yeah. valve problem. So it, it does kind of take the concept and 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 uh, simple it down, but in a lot of applications, um, just an I to P on a nice little control valve like this is more than adequate and gives you know, wonderful control. I got you, okay. But you don't have the, an output to trend, okay, on your DCS. Correct, other, other than the process variable. Yeah. I see, oh, I mean, like you say, it's a good, concept to try to uh, save costs and if you're tight on space and it's also simplification right it's it's less bracket it's less complexity and as they mentioned if you're in a uh, you know a warm and shaky environment you can put the i to p somewhere safe run a piece of tubing over and um it's a it's a pretty simple way to put in a a, a pretty effective control valve all right thank you interesting you're welcome Thank, thanks for attending we, we we hope it sparks some some thinking mm. and some consideration yeah i mean as i was entered we do have cases where we have extremely low flow rates that we're trying to control very accurately well the the key to it is picking the right valve characteristics sizing it right and putting in a good valve how fancy you decide to dress it up with accessories is up to you. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but if you get the mechanical part right, they typically work very, very well. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if these guys can hear me. Jake, can you guys hear me? They, you might have to turn yourself back on. I'm not sure what I did wrong. <laughs> so, uh, Okay, any other questions? I'll give it a second, I'll wait. I'm good, thank you. All right. All right, everybody, thanks so much for attending our presentation. I hope you found it interesting and um, relevant. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to give us a call at 800-9-LESSMAN. Again, I'm Chris Modrich. You can get me at Chris M. at Lessman if you need anything. And uh, we appreciate your time. And uh, everybody have a wonderful day.